Um, uh, good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to the Education in Conflict and Emergencies um, seminar series. Uh, this is actually the final uh, seminar in the series this uh, this academic year. So uh, uh, we'll have more <laughs> in the days to come. But um, I'm really delighted to have you. Uh, in our last seminar. So these seminars are um, recorded and live streamed for uh, the viewers in our network, Network for Research and Education in Conflict and Emergencies. Um, today's seminar is uh, slightly different um, as compared to the other uh, presentations we have had in the past. Um, so what we are trying to do um, today, I know Patrick is going to talk uh, in, in detail is to bring in um, social movement learning uh, into the debate about uh, education, conflict and emergencies. And I think um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, work that looks into how education can contribute to uh, peace, um, stability and social cohesion is around the role of international organisations, um, you know, civil society organizations and aid and education systems, um, that kind of thing, which basically prioritizes formal education in, in these uh, bigger debates. Uh, but um, social movements are uh, pretty much sort of outside uh, those mainstream um, in education and international uh, development debates. Uh, but increasingly, I think there's, there's interest in terms of how uh, communities struggle for uh, their own social development, how they struggle for their rights, uh, freedom, um, and how they contribute to the processes of uh, sustainable peace. And a lot of work in the uh, social movement looks into um, how social movements emerge um, and who are the key sort of actors in the social movements, how they impact on uh, um, sort of state building and also the negotiations between the state um, and the movements uh, but uh, not much has been actually written about uh, the stories and about the struggles of the people actually who are uh, on the ground and, uh, and I think the people who actually fight on the ground for their rights and for their uh, development are the, the ultimate defense of social justice uh, agenda and, and they, they are the ones who actually always keep this uh, um, sort of momentum of uh, justice, reconciliation and, and inclusion going. So I think this, this project which I'm also uh, involved in looks into four different countries, um, Colombia, South Africa, Turkey and Nepal. And we're trying to understand how social movements learn, how they develop their strategies, how they communicate, how they most importantly produce knowledge while being involved in the process of uh, uh, movements. So I'm delighted to have you uh, today here, uh, Patrick. Patrick Kane is a, a PhD scholar um, based in University of Sussex. Um, and uh, Patrick has a long history of uh, activism. He's previously worked with Warren Want uh, and, and has spent a lot of time in, in Colombia uh, in the last uh, few years, and, and will tell us a bit more about. Um, and Patrick is uh, presenting on uh, the case of Colombia, but uh, you know more broadly drawing upon uh, debates around social movement. Learning. So I think there'll be about forty-five minutes of talk, and then we'll have plenty of time for the discussions. Over to you, Patrick. Thank you, Thank you Tajendra. And good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for coming. Um, it's really exciting to be able to share a little bit about this project that I think it's fair to say um, we're all quite excited about and um, I might start with the caveat that we are just at the beginning of the sort of the data analysis stage and um, so what I'm going to be presenting really um, is probably quite rough and ready at the moment and it still also has to be fed through the kind of final stages of our uh, participative research process so um, it could end up being quite different but uh, I hope that it will generate at least some, some good discussion and it will be good to get your ideas uh, about some of the things that we're doing. Um, so, during my presentation I, I'm going to start off by giving a little bit of a, a, a background and an overview of the project that, that Tajendra mentioned um, uh, before then focusing in on the Columbia case study which is uh, the part that I'm directly in, involved in. 
Um, so it is a two-year project that we're engaged in, which is funded by the UK's Economic and Social Research Council, the ESRC. And uh, the title of the project o overall is Social Movement Learning in the Struggle for Peace with Social Justice four case studies from conflict-affected contexts. So um, it's led by Professor Mario Novelli at the University of Sussex, who we're working very closely with and who some of you I can see nodding or know very well. Um, and also Tejendra uh, is, is, is leading it with Mario, and there's a research team who I'll come back, back to a little bit later on. Um, so Tejendra already mentioned the four countries that are involved, Colombia, Nepal, Turkey, and South Africa. Um, very different contexts, four very different social movements that are involved um, and four countries really that are either in conflict scenarios or post-conflict scenarios or perhaps a little bit of both in some cases. So um, to explain a little bit around um, my own, where I come to, to uh, this project, um, I've worked on things in Colombia for about 12 years related to um, human rights, related to social movements, uh, trade unions and um, very much along the lines of kind of solidarity activism with, with Colombia. Um, and throughout those 12 years, um, five of which would, I would spend living in Colombia and working directly with social movements, um, throughout that time I've worked very closely with an, a small Colombian human rights organisation called Nomadesk, which is our partner in, in this research process. So, just in terms of the movements that, that we're working with, I've already mentioned Nomadesk. Um, we've also got a South African organisation called Housing Assembly, which is based in Cape Town and organises um, around the issue of housing, which is a, a, a massive issue in Cape Town, particularly um, people living in informal shacks. And um, we've also got a Turkish organization called the People's Democratic Congress, also known as the HDK in its, um, with its Turkish acronym, uh, which is an alliance of social movements um, and a historic alliance between the Kurdish liberation movement and the Turkish left in, in, in Turkey. Um, the Maneshi Foundation, uh, which is uh, based in Nepal, and is an organisation that works with and for the excluded Madeshi community. Uh, that's the, the case study which Tejendra is, is very involved with. Um, and the Madeshi community are in the Terai plains of southern Nepal. So each of the movements, in their own way and in different ways, uh, agitates and mobilises for um, basic rights. Rights to education, health, housing, the right also to life in, ma in many cases dignity and equal treatment before the law. And um, it's important also to say that really each of these organisations in different ways and to different degrees have also been the target of state repression and state violence at different times throughout, throughout their histories. So I think it's important to give a little bit of an idea about some of the background of, of this research and, and where the ideas really sprang from. Um, I think initially it came from uh, a process of kind of critical reflection upon some of us who were involved in the research and who have been involved in kind of solidarity activism in different ways over the years and some kind of reflecting upon critiques of, the, of those solidarity processes and the way, um, for example, in, in some cases the relationships between the North and the South and the old colonial roots are also followed within solidarity processes um, and tending to have this sort of sometimes a tendency towards almost paternalistic type of types of solidarity roots um, with no inten intention often but they, but they can sometimes reproduce the, the, these patterns um, and also a wish really to be able to go beyond um, some of the single issue and the limitations of solidarity processes and try to build um, kind of deeper and more meaningful, perhaps more political collection, uh, connections between social movements and breaking this sort of this north-south relationship, trying to also create south-south relationships at the same time. I think within that we also wanted to encourage processes of learning from the south. So. Um, 
we all recognize from our engagement with social movements from Colombia to Palestine to Nepal to South Africa and beyond um, that really there is much that we in the, in the north and particularly in the UK who are engaged in activism and in social movements can learn from the struggles of, of movements and activists in the south. So around trying to engage on that basis and, and really um, arguing that a lot of international solidarity work uh, doesn't give enough um, importance to the learning which can be done and to the learning processes which these connections between movements uh, can create it if we engage on, on, this, on this level. And then also partly it comes out of a, a particular reflection on the role of academics and the role of the university with regards to social movements and, social, and struggles for social change. So it's kind of an ongoing debate that some of us who are in the room have, have, have been having and have been reflecting upon and really asking ourselves um, how we uh, as academics in universities in, uh, in the global north, in the UK, might use the resources and the networks which we have at our disposal in order to support some of these struggles which are going on now, today, in countries like the ones that are involved in, in, the, in, the, in the research. Um, and really, it comes out of also being, being critical of what we perceive as an increasing separation between uh, the theory, uh, between theory and practice, even on the part of uh, many critical academics who, who become sort of very sort of distant from the, the social movement struggles of, of, of the day. Um, so partly with this project, what we're trying to do is sort of bring back some of those synergies between academia and, uh, and activism. And so here we would identify with a kind of growing body of lit literature of, from the likes of Lawrence Cox and Alf Nielsen, uh, Robert Flax, who have argued that much of the mainstream social movement theory which is out there is really too abstract and too removed from the day-to-day -day realities of people who are involved in struggle and therefore often has, has little relevance or little use to social movements themselves. Um, and also we would very much identify with the work of people like Aziz Chowdhury um, who argues that social movements produce very valuable knowledge through their struggles and it is, a, it is knowledge which is particularly important for people that are seeking and interested in social transformations. Um, so we would argue that particularly at a time like we are facing at the moment of global crisis really for humanity on so many levels that it's more important now than ever for us to be engaging genuinely as academics with these struggles for, so, for social change. Um, so really we, could, we would argue that our, our research is based upon this belief in the emancipatory uh, potential of the knowledges which are produced by social movements through their struggles for social change and that us as academics have a role to play within these struggles through building collaborations based upon solidarity, reciprocity and epistemological justice. And finally, um, we're also very influenced by the work of uh, Boa Ventura de Souza Santos in terms of what his arguments around the role of the academic and the role of the researcher and, and really rejecting the notion of the messianic uh, researcher and actually arguing that we should be much more seeking to play the role as researchers of, of facilitators or of, or of translators um, and being able to sort of bring these uh, epistemologies of social movements, alternative epistemologies which have been so excluded over generations and over centuries, we should be seeking to bring them out and acting as facilitators for that as opposed to putting the academic at the centre at the center of this. Um, so this kind of political and ethical framework uh, led to a lot of discussion um, and a lot of thought around what that would mean for us in, in terms of our, our, our own research methodolo methodological framework. Um, and we were clear that um, we all wanted a process which could be at the same time a research process and a solidarity process. And that, um, that also means viewing the process itself as just as important as the kind of final products which come out at the, at the end. Um, and we're also very keen that as part of that, 
uh, the research should should really be of use and of value to the social movements who are our partners in, in the research. Um, so on the one hand, um, that means sharing out the, the resources which are involved in the process and ensuring that it's of value in that sense, but more importantly it meant very much having joint decision making, collective decision making and, and making sure that we have genuine uh, sort of non-hierarchical forms of organising the research and developing the research framework and methodology together. Um, so on the one hand that meant at a sort of at the level of the four countries trying to develop um, or initially identifying a series of kind of cross-cutting themes which would be in, of interest for the case studies in, in all of the countries but also at the same time trying to build in enough flexibility for each country and each organisation to be able to make the, their own process of use to themselves. So um, we don't want four identical processes in, in, in the four different countries. We had to have enough flexibility so that, um, for example, if the organisation in South Africa, Housing Assembly, would be able to, to make the process something which works for them and which, which, it, which is useful for their activists in the current stage of, of, of their struggle. So you can imagine that was quite a challenging process as well, but also a really, really interesting process to, and, and, and I think it has been something that has been really a learning process for, for all of us that, that have been involved. Um, so a central aspect as well that we, that we were all really keen on from the start was um, that we wanted the project and the process to be an opportunity for the social movements which are involved also to learn from each other and to engage with each other. So this idea of creating these South-South links and, and being, being able to have these organisations go beyond what often happens when international, when, when sort of organisations from countries with repression and human rights violations meet, where conversations often don't go beyond me telling you about our human rights violations, you telling us about your human rights violations, and, and actually allowing a space where they're able to, to engage on some of the, the, the knowledge that they have accumulated, the, the, the strategies, as, as uh, Tejendra mentioned, and, and the ideas which really move them in, the, in, in their struggles. Um, and as part of that, we were keen that, although this is a, a two-year funded project, um, at the end of the project, we want this to be the, the just the beginning. We want we want connection these connections which are being created between the social movements, between us as academics, to continue and for this to be something which becomes sustainable and, and creates ongoing connections. And as part of that, we were also very keen um, in our discussions to move away from perhaps the the colonial models of research, whereby uh, the northern universities come in, develop the theory and methodology and take the credit at the end and, and it's the organisations in, in the south who are engaged in collecting the data, do a lot of the work and then sort of disappear and don't get the, get the credit at, at the end. So um, that means again developing a really strong and collective decision making process and as being sort of a, again a learning process for all of us as we've gone on and um, I should say Certainly, we haven't. I don't think any of us would argue we found a perfect formula. Uh, I think there have been a lot of tensions, a, a lot of sort of uh, things to iron out along the way. But I think that's been part of the the process and, and why we feel so positive about it. So this framework and this ethos led us to um, to, to come to the the systematization of experiences methodology, which um, particular particularly our Colombian partners, Nomadesk. Um, we're very keen on and, and uh, it's a methodology that some of you might be fami familiar with which comes out of um, sort of popular education, uh, social movement type movements in, in academic circles in Latin America and in Colombia has been, Colombia has been a real centre for, for, for this methodology. And it's, a method, it's an approach which really values the experiences and the knowledges of the protagonists of any process. So it's around really um, creating spaces of collect for collective reflection for the activists who have been involved in these processes. And, and really, um, see, uh, because of this, you can see it as a, as a kind of, at the same time, a research methodology, but also in itself a kind of knowledge generating and pedagogical process. So um, again, for us, it's, it's, been, it's been a really interesting um, 
kind of co-productive process that uh, as, as I think has been lived differently in each country, but has certainly been something that we've um, tried to at least adhere to the sort of general principles of overall. So just very briefly in terms of the, the research questions which we're, which we're dealing with, um, really what we're interested in is the, the kind of the how and the what of the knowledge, knowledge production processes and the learning which is going on within these social movements. So um, identifying um, sort of the different ways that, so that knowledge is produced within social movements and then what are the kind of, what is the knowledge and what is the learning that their praxis and their, their activity is throwing up a, 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 along the way. And at, at the same time, we're, we're also interested in, in kind of the ideas which move these movements, the ideas which influence them. Um, they, all, they all have kind of intellectual, ideological, perhaps academic influence at the, at the same time. And again, this is part of the, the, part of the idea about sort of decolonizing some of, some of the, um, the theory which is involved and, and sort of engaging with the theories which are moving these organizations and these social movements in the, in the global south. So as part of this process of kind of intermovement learning and, and intermovement uh, interaction, we've, we've had a series of, of inter-team meetings uh, where the, the team goes to, to the different countries involved in the process and meets with social movements, meets with activists, learns about the struggles the, of, the, of, the, of the country and, and really share experiences. And I think it's been probably um, the most satisfying part of, of the process and perhaps that we could um, discuss that a little bit at the end because there have been some really interesting things that have come up on, on these visits. That's a Turkey visit last July. And then before, just before I go on to the, um, to the to our Colombia case study, um, just a, just a word of, that although this is a, a very positive pro project that we're all very excited about, um, at the same time we are dealing with organisations who are operating in the context of repression, in the context of human rights violations, and um, just during the course of the the project we've had to. Um, really learn what that means for them on a day-to-day -day basis and, and engage and, and really deal with the, the difficulties that, that this crops up. So um, these are three of our social movement activists who are key members of the research team. Um, and on the far side you have Onur Hamazoglu who is the, the national co-spokesperson for the HDK in Turkey and he was actually imprisoned in January of last year, just as we were beginning the project, um, he was imprisoned because he signed a, a declaration calling for peace on behalf of academics and an end to the bombing which Turkey had started in, in Afran in Syria. Um, he was he was later released in, in, in July last year. Um, here we have Erdogan Kerku, who is another member of the Turkish team, um, also from the HDP. He just a, a couple of months ago had to leave Turkey and go into exile because he was uh, sentenced to, to six years in prison, again for calling for peace in the Kurdish region of, of, of Turkey. And in the middle we have Berenice Seleta, who is the, the leader of our Colombian partner, Nomadesk. Now Berenice um, has lived with death threats and, and attacks during, multiple, during years for, the, for her 30 year career as a human rights defender in Colombia. Um, and in 2004 was the victim of a state orchestrated plot to assassinate her and several other activists and, lead and trade union leaders in, in the city of Cali. Um, and actually in January, uh, just this, uh, January this year, four high-ranking military officials were, were sentenced to, to time in prison for orchestrating this plot to kill Berenice, which Obviously, in a country like Colombia, when there is a sentence against military figures, that really increases the risk against the victims in those crimes. So, just an idea of some of the realities that we are, are dealing with and that, that the, the social movements are dealing with on a, on a daily basis. So, to come on to, to Nomades, which is the case study that, that really I've, I've, I've been working closely with the organization on. Um, so, as I mentioned already, it's, it, it is a human rights organization. Um, Nomades takes what they would call an integral or, or holistic approach to the defense of human rights and um, that really means that aside from 
maybe the, the bread and butter of human rights defence, the kind of investigating, raising the alert around, around crimes um, and advocacy work. They also put a very high importance on education work and on participatory action research, which is really around trying to empower communities um, who are faced with human rights violations in order to, for the, for the, and social movements as well, in order to be able to confront the situations which they face. Um, they also take a radical approach to human rights defence, radical in really the truest definition of the word radical, which means to, to, to go to the, to the roots of the problem. So they would argue that you can only really defend human rights by, by looking at the structural causes and having an analysis of really what is behind these, these human rights violations. And, Therefore, they would reject the, the notion of neutral human rights defence um, and really would see themselves as on the sides of the social movements and the communities whose human rights they are defending and, um, and really would see themselves as part of the, of, of the social movement. So Nomades works in the, with, with social movements across southwest Colombia, works with indigenous communities, peasant communities, black communities, trade unions, uh, students groups, really all across, uh, across the social movement. And um, uh, to talk a little bit around what has been the focus of our, of our Columbia case study, which has been the pedagogical strategy which Nomales have, have developed. So as part of, uh, of their work, during the late 1990s, the paramilitaries arrived to, to, to the southwest of Colombia and it led to a huge rise in human rights violations, attacks against social movements, attacks against the civilian populations, massacres, targeted assassinations. Um, and really, uh, Nomades, what they, try, they tried to do in response to this, aside from documenting what was going on, raising the alert, they also saw the need um, to, to, to prepare a pedagogical response for the, for the communities and the social movements who were being targeted by this violence. Um, which meant, on the one hand, trying to provide communities and activists with uh, basic tools, basic knowledge and, and information to be able to respond to human rights violations as they were happening, to know what to do in, in quite a basic way. But on the other hand, also trying to um, really provide um, a response to some of the atomization and the fragmentation which had been caused by this kind of onslaught of violence. So what they were finding was that as a result of uh, the levels of violence against, against social movements and communities, they were stopping collaborating, they were stopping coordinating between the different movements and kind of going into themselves. So um, what Nomades sought to do was, with this pedagogical strategy, was kind of bring the different sectors together, put them in a room together, indigenous activists, indigenous community members with trade unionists, with students, and sort of uh, get them to, to start collaborating again and to, to really put them together. And it's, this is a theme which <coughs> is really important and, and which I'll come back to in terms of not as pedagogical work. So initially the, the pedagogical strategy took the form of a popular education um, human rights diploma program which ran from sort of the early 2000s up until 2010 so um, it was a program which um, ran and over 650 social movement activists community leaders from across the southwest region went through this program um, and sort of their organizations and social movements benefited from, from, from that participation and subsequently from 2010 onwards uh, you see sort of the, the next phase of, of this pedagogical strategy which was where um, with the social movements who were involved in the process they took the decision <coughs> to create the Intercultural University of the Peoples which is a, a popular university run by and for social movement activists and a kind of university with a bit of a difference which again um, I can come on to and, and perhaps we can discuss a little bit toward, towards the end um, but really it's important to note that it's a strategy which has now spanned two decades. It has very distinct phases, but you can understand it as, as sort of the same pedagogical strategy which has developed depending upon the needs and the different conjunctures which are going on within social movements, within the communities and within the territories of Southwest Colombia. 
So this is just a photograph of one of the sessions of the Intercultural University of the Peoples, which was taken uh, in October, in November, sorry, la last year. Members of uh, different communities and social movements who were involved in the process. So to give a very, very quick uh, overview of the, of the, the context in which Nomadesk is operating, um, really, um, I'm not going to go into, into this very much, but just to sort of highlight, most people will be aware that Colombia has had a very long-running series of inter armed, internal armed conflicts with multiple different guerrilla groups. Um, there was a, a peace agreement in November 2016 between the largest guerrilla group, the FARC, and the Colombian state, um, but the conflict continues between the second largest guerrilla group, the ELN, and the government, and unfortunately, the peace, agreement, peace process uh, between them has stalled um, since the new government, the new president came in uh, last year. And it's important just to, to highlight that there has actually been an increase in violence and killings of uh, so activists and social movement leaders since the signing of the peace agreement in November 2016. Uh, you can see there that just last year there were 172 social leaders and activists assassinated in, in, in Colombia. Um, and at the same time, important to draw attention to the fact that Colombia has always had a, a very vibrant uh, social movement scene. It's always had a lot of kind of social mobilization, social, social protest. And the southwest of Colombia in particular, where Nomadisk is, is, is operating, has been a particular hub for the, for, for, for the different social movements. Trade unions, uh, the, for, the, the Afro, for the, the black movement, and also for the, for, for the indigenous movement. So just in terms of our research process with, with, with Nomadesk, um, I mentioned earlier on that a re the really important aspect of, of making the process work for the social movement partners involved um, and making it something which is really useful and of value to them. So in Nomadesk's case, <coughs> that meant really having the opportunity to take time to reflect upon, uh, collectively reflect upon what had been for them a, a process that had gone on for 20 years almost, but which they'd never really had a chance to sit down in a structured way and sort of analyse what what really what what was it for? What, what what is the learning which has come out of this? And most importantly, for them to think about how those lessons can can really serve to strengthen what they are doing now with the Intercultural University of the People. So um, that was something that they were really keen on that it should be um, should be of use for them currently in, in their pedagogical process and not just for the sort of the four country um, the four country case study. So um, our workshops and our interviews were with people who had been related and been involved in this pedagogical process throughout the past two decades in all different types of ways um, and at all, all different moments of, of that history. And, the, and for the territorial workshops, we actually went to um, the territories of the social movements who, um, who were involved in the process and, and carried out. I'll show you a photo of one of those in a, in a moment. Um, and it really involved could agree, and although we had these kind of overarching themes and these overarching framework from the, the Four Country Project, we really took that and then passed it through a collective process with Nomadesk. To, to agree the themes and objectives of the specific systematization of experiences process in, in, in Colombia. Um, and I should just say as well that if, although I'm presenting here and, um, and uh, I'm the, the sort of face of it currently, that it's been very much a, a co production process. We're also working closely with a, a, a local researcher in Colombia who's called David Razo. So between him and the Nomades team, it's very much a, a collective um, endeavor that we're involved in. I'm going to go through just to move on time-wise. So this is a photo of one of the territorial workshops which we had in, in October of last year in, in La Toma community, which is a, an Afro-Colombian community in, in Cauca region. Again, a, a community which has been engaged in historic struggles in, uh, within Colombia. So, to come on to, to some of our findings, our, our initial findings within uh, the, the, the research process in, in Colombia. Um, in terms of the how of how Nomadesk works, uh, how Nomadesk learns, um, 
there's been some really interesting things that have, that have been coming out here and I, I think the first point uh, to make is around sort of the importance of this holistic approach which Nomadisk has. So um, whilst we have focused upon the, the pedagogical strategy, um, really you can't understand um, the pedagogical strategy without understanding how it relates to the rest of Nomadisk's work and it's really focused um, upon um, getting to action. So it's, a, it's very much an action focused uh, pedagogical work and, and it links into the strategic litigation, it links into the human rights sort of uh, investigations that Nomadis does, it links into the, to the, to the video and the audio documentary work that they do. It's all sort of um, interconnected and that, that gives uh, really rich knowledge producing processes um, which has been interesting for us to sort of try and disentangle in some of the conversations and, and the workshops which we've been having with, with Nomadis. Um, and so because of this sort of relationship which Nomadis has with the social movements, uh, the pedagogical work is very much embedded within the social struggles um, of social movements in, in southwest Colombia. So um, to track the evolution and the different phases of this pedagogical process really is to track the kind of uh, different, the, the, the way that the, the conflict has, has developed in the, in the southwest region, it is to track the social movement struggles, and it's also to, to track the way that um, the neoliberal economic uh, extractive, uh, extractivist based economic model has been implemented. Um, so it's, it's interesting here, the relationship, there's a kind of dialogical relationship um, between the way that Nomadist tries to strengthen social movements in their struggles, but at the same time their pedagogical process is shaped by those struggles. So um, really um, being able to, to be driven by what's happening and to learn from what is happening in social movement struggles and, and adapt the pedagogical process and the pedagogy and the themes which are being taught as a, resu as a result of that. Um, so it, make, it makes a really dynamic process which is constantly being changed and, and adapted and um, just one example was that shift from the Human Rights Diploma Programme to the uni Intercultural University but throughout the way you can see the way that um, there's been shifts in sort of the focus, um, shifts in sort of the themes which are being taught and being discussed and also in terms of the social movements that are participating in the, in the pedagogical strategy. So, um, really the, the praxis is, is central here as well and, and I think um, it's really interesting to think about you've got these broad range from indigenous communities to uh, trade unionists to, uh, to, um, to peasant communities etc and they all bring different experiences their struggles are slightly different but linked at the same time and over, or you can imagine their engagement over a long period of time that all feeds into, and then their practice all feeds into the, uh, the pedagogical strategy and sort of this, um, it gives it a real richness and, and the knowledges and the concepts and the discourses which have been developed along the way really reflect that and it's something that, um, that really has been fascinating in, in the research process in Colombia and that we're hoping to be able to, to do justice to with the, with the research. Um, so as part of this, um, really, a really key aspect of the work is that rather than trying to provide a ready-made solution to the communities and the social movements that they work with, NOMAIS really is, it takes a, a, an approach of, of valuing uh, the knowledge which is held within the social movements and trying to work with communities to, to develop their own solutions um, rather than imposing a solution from, from outside. Um, and that's where we come on to the issue of, the, of knowledge dialogue. Um, and interculturality, which uh, if people are aware of, familiar with Paulo Freire's work, uh, they'll be aware with, with knowledge dialogue and this notion, uh, this pedagogical notion. And I think this is something that really that you can see in practice in, in nomadists' work, where you have this kind of rich, uh, uh, different experiences, also multi generational as well, uh, in these dialogues. Um, really have a, a knowledge generating potential, it's an important aspect of Nomadesk's work and um, alongside that it, interculturality is it's kind of a, a I, would, I would argue it's an epistemological approach in that um, it 
rejects the notion of a hierarchy of knowledge or a hierarchy of where, where a, an expert or a professional or an academic comes in from outside and, and uh, has sort of superiority over, um, of, over the, the participants and really seeks to sort of uh, value all of the knowledges which are in the room. And that doesn't mean rejecting academic knowledge or rejecting the idea of experts. So often workshops will be facilitated by academics or, or, or professionals, but very much on the basis of valuing what everybody in the room brings to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the conversation. So some of the, um, the most important uh, members of the university and, and members of the diploma program have been um, people who, for example, are illiterate, people who are in the 70s, also we've, we've had people who are teenagers, very, very young uh, people involved in the process. So it's, it's a really sort of rich uh, intercultural program which, which they have. And I guess this also reflects the work, the, the, the influence of uh, Orlando Falsborda, that, that some of you might be aware of as well, the Colombian sociologist, and who really pushed the participate reaction research um, sort of methodology and um, partic is particularly influential within social movements in, in Colombia. So I guess uh, and, and this in, in idea of interculturality is really important at the moment. Um, it's a bit of a buzzword within uh, social movements in Colombia and it's really about around this idea of um, trying to create unity but from a position of diversity and um, overcoming something that perhaps has tended to happen within social movements and within the left historically whereby different identity, identities are collapsed in order to come together around a common aim and really this is around sort of bringing together different sectors but on the basis of respecting the different identities and their, and their different cultures which they, which they bring together and seeking to forge a common class consciousness and, and forge common um, uh, common objectives and common struggle through, through that coming together. And then just finally, um, this issue of, of historical memory and this is something which is a very important aspect of Nomadesk's work, the, uh, the, the, the notion of historical memory um, and I would argue ac across social movements in Colombia it's a, it's a very important uh, aspect of, of the work and I think it's interesting when people talk about historical memory in Colombia uh, it's around remembering previous struggles, remembering uh, people who have been killed, remembering martyrs, uh, remembering losses, even telling of stories within social movements and, and I, it's interesting to think of this as um, through a knowledge perspective, right, where actually um, when we talk about historical memory within social movements, we are talking about preserving the knowledge within a movement and remembering histories which official histories are never going to tell, but preserving that knowledge and preserving that history for the movement and seeing that as a way that the struggle is, is continued and the struggle is reproduced. So in terms of some of the... the what has Nomadist learned, some of, some of the themes um, first of all, around the, the context of, of repression and sort of social movements operating in context, context of repression. I guess, um, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, Nomadist's pedagogical strategy was a response to, can be understood as a, as a response to kind of this uh, fragmentation and the atomization which was caused by this massive kind of paramilitary onslaught at the end of the 1990s in, in, in the southwest region. Um, but one thing that came out quite strongly um, in our research process was the way that at the same time the social movements involved managed to turn that violence into a unifying factor and that almost as a, re as a survival response through this process they had to come together and it was actually that violence that forced them to start to, to collaborate and actually um, I think what Nomadist managed to realize and, and instrumentalize was that, and something that comes out very strongly, is that that violence and that, that repression is almost a generalized experience. Almost all of the movements, or, or all of the movements which are involved in this process, have experienced that repression, have experienced human rights violations, and really that gives them something in common. And it was something that 
actually when you put them together and get them to engage with that, as it, it can be really a, something that can raise consciousness and can forge unity between, between them at the same time. So this idea of uh, the violence can be atomizing but also can be used as something which, which can bring uh, organizations together. And quite interestingly, we also had something come up a few times in some of the interviews where a couple of activists uh, at least referred to the fact that they felt that the peace process from 2010 onwards had almost done the opposite, that once the peace process started, some of the social movements kind of relaxed and, and some of these uh, networks and collaborations sort of started to fall away a bit. So that was quite an interesting um, sort of dynamic that, that, we, that we had come up. And then um, another aspect is around the, this, the impact which violence uh, can have upon knowledge processes and practices. The, and the way that violence and repression um, really, uh, we're thinking here around um, when an activist or a leader is murdered or is put in prison or is forced to go into exile, quite rightly often the focus would be on, on the human impact and on what that means in terms of the grief, what that means in terms of the fear which this instills in the social movement and how that would affect the organisation. But, but little attention is often paid also to the knowledge which that leader has with them and takes with them often. And often that is knowledge which isn't documented and written down within the organisation. And, and it's something that um, might be tacit knowledge, it might be strategic knowledge, it might be the experience that they take, or it might be uh, actual intelligence and information which, which, which they carry in their heads but, but, they don't, um, but, but they don't have written down anywhere. And this was something that we saw in particular um, in a community uh, that we were working with in the city of Buenaventura in Isla de la Paz, but a neighborhood where um, the, the leader there, Don Temis, who's in the photo here, was, was murdered last January. Um, and aside from, the, from obviously the, the horrendous impact that it had on, on so many of us, um, there was also a feeling when, when he was killed, of, he, was, he was known as an encyclopedia of knowledge within his community. He carried so much knowledge around uh, the different struggles which his community was having against people who were trying to come in and take the land from the community. And, he t and a lot of that knowledge wasn't documented. So, um, I think it's, an, it's something which, which came out in, in our discussions and it was a, a, an interesting aspect um, to, to think about in these contexts. And then, to come back to this issue of historical memory, which again, I, I can't emphasize enough how, how important this is, and I think it's something, when we're talking about um, sort of things that we can learn from social movements, uh, in Colombia, this issue of historical memory, I think, is really important, um, and for, for, for it becomes particularly important in situations of conflict, of violence and repression, um, because it really, in a point, when you have uh, this violence of the state, um, to to remember and to to remember the dead, to remember past experiences of struggle, uh, to remember the human rights violations which which the social movements have been victims of becomes in itself an act of resistance. So, um, so keeping this memory alive really um, is central to, um, to being able to, to, to continue these, these struggles. And that goes beyond um, sort of the, the formal spaces and commemorations. I think it, it also includes just storytelling on an informal basis. It includes songs, it includes culture. Um, and really, um, people, particularly in um, in sort of the, the victims' movements within Colombia, talk a lot about um, the sort of the violence of the state as as almost an attempt to enforce amnesia. So so this is where sort of the, the issue of memory is really important, and I think at the centre of historical memory, really what we're talking about is this idea of keeping knowledge alive and keeping reproducing the struggle through these kind of different um, aspects, which are are all knowledge practices, right? And then. The other thing that came out really strongly was the importance in this context of sort of the constant, um, the constant threat of violence and the constant threat that repression uh, has upon, upon activists in, in these contexts was the importance of human relationships and sort of the importance of those trust-based relationships and um, the, the, this kind of solidarity, um, the importance of humour 
um, and sort of just in terms of being able to keep going in, in those situations and storytelling becomes a, a really important aspect of, of the work and uh, it's really interesting in Colombia that <coughs> kind of dealing with activists who are genuinely dealing on a day-to-day -day basis with, uh, with the threat of violence and sort of high levels of stress and fear the levels of um, sort of the importance that they give to being able to laugh and to, to tell a joke becomes really important to them. And they sit they, they, in our workshops. Um, on the one hand, it was quite difficult sometimes to get them to concentrate and move away from sort of laughing and telling stories and remembering. Um, but it was when we got them talking about that, they said, "Well, this is part of you know, this is what we do. This is how this is how we kind of keep going." So um, it was a really interesting aspect. aspect. And then. Um, just in terms of the, the, the peace process, another thing that, that, that came out very strongly was kind of the real disconnect which people felt between the peace that was signed in Havana between the government and, and the FARC and the reality which people were living in their communities and sort of the, the feeling, this was a phrase that came up, that the, the uh, territorial peace never, or peace never arrived to our territory, territorial peace never, never came for us, um, so particularly the indigenous communities in Cauca who really, um, for them there's been a continuity of violence and the, the fog kind of moved out of their communities but um, new groups moved in and there are more groups than before and now they don't even know who they are. So for them they were saying well actually things are probably worse than they were before. So, so then in terms of uh, the, the issue of geographies and, and temporalities of solidarity. This, this is just to sort of draw attention to um, a, co a couple of things here and then, and then I'll sort of leave for, for questions. Um, but really, one thing that people were, were felt very keenly, particularly in, commu in remote communities, um, away from, from, from the urban centres, was the feeling um, that Nomades really played a role of linking them into sort of from local to national and international networks and the, the feeling of um, in situations of being vulnerable to human rights violations, that that kind of feeling, that sort of the, that network of sort of act solidarity activism, of human rights <coughs> activism, um, and feeling connected for them had been really important during the during the particularly during the early years uh, of during the t the early two thousands when it felt like um, the paramilitary violence was sort of all encompassing. Uh, this feeling of, of having an organisation that was connected into bro broader networks of solidarity was, was really important for them. And then also the issue, um, just, to, just to come down um, quite quickly here, the issue of territory uh, as, is a concept which we could spend all night really discussing, but for social movements in Colombia, particularly indigenous communities, peasant communities and, and black communities, um, territory has a much broader meaning than perhaps in English we would think of it as sort of a, a piece of land. It really encompasses, it, it, well, it says, yeah, a territorio es vida. It's sort of the idea that uh, a territory is everything, all the life and environment which is, in, which is held with it within a place. And, and the struggle for territory is really the way that many of these communities articulate their demands. And it's a really interesting uh, way that that has become sort of over the years, that has become a central part of kind of the, the conceptual constructions of, of Nomadesque's work. Um, and then, um, just finally to say that the, the, in terms of the temporality, one of the interesting things was kind of this, um, different to a lot of NGOs, the, the, the idea of kind of building long-term uh, relationships and, and, and what that has meant for Nomadesque in terms of building trust-based, um, very deep connections with social movements in the region and, and being able to take a very strategic approach to that work and sort of build plans over long periods of time but also being very flexible and sort of understanding that the rhythms of communities uh, or communities and social movements have their own rhythms in, in, in Colombia and, and not trying to impose a rhythm from outside um, and at the same time the, the human rights situation also has its own rhythm in Colombia and often Nomadisk has to be responsive and reactive to the human rights violations as they take place and that means that their kind of pedagogical work also has to has to adapt to, to, to those temporalities. Now I just went quickly over this but I'm not going to talk to this uh, because I've talked too long already but um, this was just to give really an idea of kind of the, the richness of um, sort of the, the concepts, the epistemologies, the, the different cosmovisions that have 
that have really developed over two decades within the nomadisk uh, pedagogical strategy. And I think I mentioned earlier about how um, it's really been a construction and a, a, that has been gradual along the way. And these are some of the, um, the different kind of discourses and concepts which nomadisk, which came up in, in the way that people talked around the process. And I think it's really interesting because it's a real richness there about, um, and, and it comes from all of the different sectors that are involved in, um, in, in this work. Uh, we could maybe talk a little bit about it at the end, but it's just to give an idea of kind of the different types of knowledge which are involved that we're talking about here. And I think, I think I'll leave it there because I've already spoken for, for too long. But, um, but as you can see, it's something that, that we've all, we're all quite excited about. And uh, I think there's so many things that I would have liked to include here as well. So. Um, hopefully we can hear some of your ideas and, uh, and, and get a bit of discussion going about it as well because that's the idea to sort of be able to engage on it on that level. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. That was really, really stimulating. I think one of the um, significant features of this project has been to build this solidarity between the activists, um, you know, from four different countries. And, and I think we are usually kind of used to conducting research which is more kind of top-down university academics designing a project and uh, collecting data and just bringing, bringing it back to universities and writing up and publishing and just progressing in our careers. Um, and, but the knowledge is not necessarily disseminated to the people who actually produce that and they're not necessarily uh, directly involving in changing the life conditions of the people who are at the grassroots level and I think that's what we're trying to rupture in this project and, and this has been quite uh, a stimulating and quite exciting uh, unconventional experience for, for many of us um, and I think that's, uh, that's really sort of that came out from, from your, your presentation so which is that the process is uh, as important as the um, sort of ultimate outcome. We will write the journal articles, there's no doubt, otherwise we'll be <laughs> in trouble, but I think that's not the most important thing here. Um, but I think the, the point that you made about uh, the importance of human relationships in, in crisis context, when people suffer these kind of brutalities and attacks and atrocities, and I think they, 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 the pain at the same time can you know, change into some kind of humor laughter and, and some sort of celebration and certainly for some of us visiting Colombia and engaging with these activists was uh, um, you know surreal quite quite you know amazing experience if you like at the same time colleagues are um, you know telling very sort of moving stories about the the, the terrible experiences that they have had uh, and, and then certainly they crack jokes and laugh and they do music and dance and, you know, I think these are very powerful human dimensions which uh, help people, uh, you know, staying, surviving and keeping going in, in their struggles. I think that was a very powerful thing. We often miss out those things and we look at these uh, approaches only from the technical processes of, you know, how do we solve their problems. I think there's an enormous amount of strength in those communities which, which need to be um, celebrated. So thank you very much and I think um, the, the floor is open for comments and uh, suggestions, questions um, and, and everything. Discussion afterwards, yeah. Uh, and I have many, many, many questions. I will, <laughs> in, I will stick uh, to one thank you what you presented. It was very interesting. However, I, I am quite curious about uh, this solidarity a change you're constructing because it seems like really uh, poli representing a political view of the events of Colombia. I'm asking this not only by the way you present the facts about paramilitaries and guerrilla, also some pictures, you know, there was the communist hand and Allende. So I, I'm really curious to know if, if these nomadesque leaders, Berenice and David, they seem to have like a strong political views. And it worries me in a sense the historical memory that you're aiming to construct is going to be a little bit biased into one part of the of what's happening and also you said um, just to I have a couple of notes here it was really unfortunately that the ELN negotiations were uh, closed after this new president however I think it's really really important to acknowledge and to share with our colleagues here uh, the ELN guerrillas 
were still doing bombings and like they, 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 they don't close it because that's just not the peace but because they kept doing lots of bombing and attack and raping girls and uh, recruiting children so under these circumstances there was not possibility to continue the peace process and I, I remember you start your conference saying no justice no peace and also I think the FARC a peace treaty had a lot of issues there was not truth not reparation for the victims and not justice so I, I, I think if we're aiming to construct this historical memory in Colombia it's really important to acknowledge all the facts and all the history that uh, emerged and, and caused this uh, more than 60 years of paramilitaries and guerrillas and so I think it's very important to have all these facts in mind when constructing this historical memory. Okay, do you want to respond to that too? I, I, I think that's quite quite a lot there, so I could be the rest of the night. But really important <laughs> issues. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, first of all, as I was making clear at the start, it definitely the, we make no bones about the fact that it's, it's based upon um, a sort of identification and a political identification with the struggles of the social movements involved and um, the notion of, um, of sort of neutrality in nominalist work doesn't come into it. So yeah, they do take a political approach, as I said at the start, to, to, to their work and uh, they identify with the struggles of the trade unions that, that, that they work with, for example, Sintra and Kali, Sintra and Nicole, they identify with the struggles of the indigenous communities who have been, who have been so um, so uh, sort of targeted by, by the violence, uh, including from paramilitaries and from the guerrilla for, for, for generations, as you know. And um, all of the different struggles, undoubtedly, they, they, do, they do take that and they make no apologies. And it, and it comes from um, certainly an analysis uh, which they have and we would share of, of, of the conflict and of the structural causes of the conflict in Colombia. Um, and one which certainly um, would would not identify with um, with, with sort of the, the analysis that you, that you presented in, in terms of um, the kind of state responsibility for, for ultimately for the protection of, of human rights within Colombia and sort of an analysis of how the guerrillas came to life in the in the in the, in the first place within, within Colombia. So um, when we talk about historical memory, certainly it's not about trying to construct the historical memory of Colombia. It's around so trying to, they're talking about the, the historical memory of our struggles because the argument within social movements is that the Colombian state is never going to write that history for us. The history, the official history, will, will look very different. And I don't know if you've been following um, the issue with the the, the national me, the, the national history centro the memoria historica where where the, the new government have just put in um, a, a very right wing. Um, sort of person, person to, to lead this process who denies the conflict and now a lot of the social movements who have been collaborating with this National Commission for, for Historical Memory are now asking to have their information taken out because they feel there's a, a complete breakdown in trust with the, this institution. So really what I'm talking about in terms of historical memory in, in, in this case is about social movements and human rights organisations having to take it upon themselves to recognize and to document their own struggles and sort of, and as I was trying to make clear in the, the, the presentation, for them that's as much for the outside around saying, look, these are the statistics, these are the people we have had murdered within, within these are activists who were killed by different, by different actors in the armed conflict, um, but it's also about them on an internal level sort of preserving themselves and preserving the history of their movements and, and, and that is, as being something that they can let them carry on. Now, in terms of the the, the issue around the ELM, yeah, I mean, you're right, the, the ELM carried on. I wasn't trying to, to give um, a particular analysis. I, I, that wasn't part of my presentation around, around the conflict um, and around sort of the, the reasons why, why the peace process were, was, kind of, was put on hold. I would argue that since uh, the, the new president came in, he made it very clear to okay, that, that he had no interest really in continuing that process. So although the ELM did carry, did carry on um, and did, did carry on their sort of their guerrilla warfare, um, certainly the, the peace process was already pretty much um, in Duque's eyes was, was, was going nowhere and it wasn't something that they were going to take on. Now, we can argue about the rights and wrongs of that um, and, and, and why it happened, but. Um, Ultimately, the point was that since since the new president came in, 
the priest process really has, has been going nowhere. So I mean, whether I mean we could probably disagree on that around around why, why that is, but but yeah. Um, and then again in in, in, ter in terms of the, 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 the fog, yeah, I mean again we could we could argue all night around the sort of rights and wrongs of the HIP, the, the transitional justice system and the sort of the different aspects. I think um, my opinion would be that uh, the previous president, Juan Manuel Santos, made a, a huge mistake when he decided to put the, every single aspect of the peace agreement through the, through the Congress to be debated. And it meant that a lot of what ended up being approved as the sort of peace, um, transitional justice and other aspects ended up looking very different from what was initially agreed in the first place. And um, I actually think it, it ended up being um, very much beneficial to, to, the, to the military and very much beneficial to the other side um, and, and ended up sort of almost kind of uh, the process of criminalization um, to, towards, towards leaders of the FARC. But um, again, we can, yeah. we can argue it's not really the, the sort of um, the, the focus of the talk. I, I, I agree. Um, if, I mean, if, if it was the focus, then it would, I would have given a much fuller analysis, but these are sort of, um, I mean, Part of what we're presenting here as well, remember, is is around um, a social a pro what has come out of this process, which is a collaborative piece, uh, a collaborative research process with the social movement who have operated in this context for the last uh, 25 years, and with activists who have been engaged in this dealing day in day out with um, murders of of, of, uh, of of colleagues, with murders of activists, with massacres, and um, throughout that time. So. Um, as I said, this is a collective sort of construction, and I'm presenting the things that have really come out um, through, through that process, rather than trying to engage in a sort of macro analysis of, of what has happened within, within the Colombian peace process or, or, the, or the Colombian conflict. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Um, really enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. Um, I was particularly interested in the, um, the intercultural uh, university of peoples and was just keen for you to talk a little bit more about what, what that university involves and also I'm vaguely aware that there's a broader movement in the region around popular universities and if you could say a little bit more about that and um, yeah, why, why, why university? I'm intrigued. That's one of the confusing uh, concepts, you know, because we particularly understand university in a, in a particular way, and, and, and what we've learned is it's a different approach, so I think that would definitely be useful. Um, yeah, so there's one more question. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to try. Um, thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, could you explain a little bit more? You said you had to start the analysis process? Right. So from a participatory perspective, what's that going to look like? How are you going to make sure that you guys don't do it all? As it were, I may appreciate that, just because it's something that's not often discussed. So yeah. how, how are you going to go? Will you go that in four areas and then bring everyone together? Like it's just from a practical perspective. And just one more about the accessible final products. Has it been a bit of reflection already on what they'll look like, the type of form they'll take, and then why? So, yeah, in terms of the the in the cultural university of the peoples, it, it does kind of um, cause a bit of confusion, particularly with um, the kind of people, I guess, from 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 sort of outside of the social movement circles, because it's I guess it's part of Nomadesk's argument around well, why should who who gets to to define the term university and what what is uh, a university anyway and who is it for and and kind of. Um, it is part of sort of, I guess, um, following on the footsteps of, uh, for example, the, the Madres de la Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, um, who, who, who have been engaged in a similar university, um, or the MST, the, uh, the Movimiento Sin Tierra in, in, in Brazil. Um, this idea of kind of, um, first of all, changing our concept of what, what is a university. So, um, for Nomades, uh, first of all, that means breaking out of the idea that the university is where I go for an individual education for me to benefit my future and my career. And 
really the first sort of principle of the intercultural university of the peoples is that it exists to strengthen the collectives and it exists to strengthen social movements themselves. So um, you can't, it's not a university that you can apply to go to. Um, people come to the university through their social movement. So um, each organization and each social movement which is a member of this university will um, will send will, will send sort of two people, a, 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 a male and a female, to go and part, participate in, in the process. Um, so that's I guess that's the first thing. It's around sort of um, strengthening collectives as, a, as opposed to individuals. Um, and then around sort of changing the notion, uh, also kind of uh, notions of kind of the spatiality of a university. So um, they have, I didn't have time to go into it there, but a very t sort of um, kind of, they, they call it territorial pedagogy, which means actually um, half of the, the, the sessions of the university are conducted in the communities um, in, in the territories of social movements, they go, they take the group out to the community. Um, in a sort of practical sense, the, the university doesn't have a site. They're, they're hoping to get to have a site. Um, it remains kind of a, a, a group, a sort of program uh, where people get together and have a residential workshop every two every two weeks or to every month. Um, it's something um, which. I guess that one of the big changes is the, the temporality that it goes much more in depth and now they're, they're running three year courses. Um, so it's it's something that is a, is a conception um, which really is around them saying, well, well, well why why shouldn't we call it a university? Why, should, why, why can't we recognize that we are also in, engaged in producing knowledge in, in, our, in our struggle um, and that these social movements also are legitimate and have the right to kind of to, to produce knowledge. So one of the interesting debates within the university has been around uh, whether the university should seek legitimation and should seek uh, sort of accreditation from the Colombian state. Um, and that was a really interesting debate where um, it almost divided around generational lines where you had sort of some of the, the elder activists uh, who were involved who argued, well, well no, as, as social movements we have we have total legitimacy to, to be to accredit uh, the the people who come come out and who study in, in the university and, and why shouldn't we do that because we we are we are at the end of it we are trying to um, we are coming from a criticism of sort of mainstream academia and we are trying to bring about societal changes and um, but then on the other side um, you have the sort of younger generation who had a more sort of pragmatic approach and said well that might be the case but actually we could still do with having some sort of certificate from a university which says that we have studied and uh, you're talking about a lot of people uh, you're talking about people who might not have the opportunity to go to university so um, for them to have some sort of certificate is really a, a big deal and it was actually um, sort of in the, in the first cohort because they decided it would be an ongoing debate for each cohort but in the first cohort it was the younger generation who, um, who won that debate so, um, so, so the idea that um, we do seek accreditation, but without giving up the principles that we are, uh, and, given, and without sort of compromising on the pedagogy which we are involved in. Um, so, in terms of the, the participatory process, uh, I guess that's been it has been probably the most challenging side because um, I mean you can imagine the sort of I said at the start, Nomadisk is a small organisation. It's operating in the context of sort of widespread human rights violations uh, across uh, across the southwest of Colombia and um, really getting getting them to sit down and engage in sort of in some of this this process it has been very difficult it's been around um, first of all making sure it was sort of tailored to, tailored to the needs of nominees so, so that it was it, we were sort of really uh, putting at the heart of it things that the organization itself had stated that there was a need and then being quite opportunistic in terms of the opportunities for that participation so finding ways to sort of maybe sort of, uh, during bus journeys or, or checking things and sort of just being really kind of persistent at times and, uh, and very patient at other times I guess so um, it has managed to so we've had an initial kind of um, document sort of our preliminary document we managed to get sort of um, a way of co-producing where um, 
I sort of started off with an interview, uh, brought it up, put some other stuff in, sent it to the to the other team members, got some feedback, or got, in, got ignored for a few months, then got some <laughs> feedback, and sort of gradually um, managed to get a, a final product that was very much had that had the reflected sort of a, a collective process, but quite improvised at times. You see what I mean? And then, um, so some of the data analysis now we're kind of going into way. <coughs> I think that's going to be the challenge in terms of me and the local researcher. I think we're going to do some of the data analysis, but it's based on sort of this. We have this kind of um, the framework which was collectively developed. So the idea is that we then go and sort of analyze the data using the framework which was collectively developed, and then in in May we have sort of a where I'm going to Colombia and we have um, a kind of a, a workshop where we're going to sort of go back to them again and say, look, these are some of the things that are coming out. This is sort of um, the analysis that, that, we, that we've made initially, what do you think? And that's where they'll probably throw it all out and say, no, you're totally wrong, it's going to be <laughs> something, something, something totally different. So, um, and then in terms of the, the final products, that was something that they were very keen on because obviously um, I'm sure it's going to be fantastic, the, the, the case study <coughs> academic report that we do. But, um, but they were saying, well, we'd like something that's actually useful for our activists and for the social movements that, that are engaged in this process. So, um, on the one hand, a video. They've been sort of each of the um, territorial workshops. They've been engaged. They've got a very good communications team, no matter. So they've been um, filming interviews, etc., and are going to make a video of the process. And then at the same time, um, sort of a series of brochures is what we're talking about, or sort of pamphlets, which kind of pull out the key sort of um, findings and are able to articulate sort of some of the stuff that, come, that comes out. But it's still a kind of ongoing discussion, but those are the two sort of main things that we've discussed about. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I'm just going to ask one more question. Yeah, I'm just going to ask one more question. Yeah, I'm just going to ask one more question. Yeah, um, so it's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick. So thank you.